Good morning. This is uh, the House Health Care Committee. And we are, oh, let's see, it's February 4th, is it? I think, yeah. And um, yes, two days post our massive Groundhog Day celebrations. So uh, we are, that's how I can tell it, what day it is. Okay, Bill. Uh, <laughs> Today, we are going to focus the entire day, actually, on the important issues of the mental health system in Vermont. And we have scheduled time this morning uh, to uh, have a great deal of time with the commissioner of the Department of Mental Health and, I see, and the deputy commissioner. And there may be other staff that uh, they have brought with them, which I'll have them introduce. And then uh, later in the morning, we'll be hearing also from uh, Julie Tesler from the um, care partners, which represent, which are the community mental health, developmental disabilities, substance use disorder providers in our communities who contract with the Department of Mental Health. And this afternoon, we're going to be hearing from some other stakeholders. So um, welcome, Commissioner and Deputy Commissioner and others. Uh, glad to have you with us. I think we have done our introductions to most of you, but not all of you, but we'll, I think we'll proceed as if we have. And um, we, ha we have between now and probably late morning, for or not very late morning, but late morning, we have a good chunk of time because this is a really important issue for this committee. Uh, it's an important issue for Vermonters, it's but we have just so people, who, who are tuning in and may not follow us regularly understand that as the healthcare committee, we also have been given jurisdiction specifically of mental health care, uh, which we consider an essential part of healthcare broadly. Uh, and we have a particular um, interest in understanding it more fully. And then as we approach the budget process, which we will not focus on primarily today, but we will be inviting Commissioner Squirrel back to meet with us, I believe, on again on Tuesday. Uh, just pull up a chair and stay for a while, you know? Uh, so, uh, but we'll be focusing on budget issues, but the conversation and information today will help lay the background uh, for, particularly for newer members and for those of us who've been on the committee for a while. We're gonna get some updates and other information. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Commissioner Squirrel and uh, ask you to help guide us through um, information and some questions that were forwarded to you earlier by our uh, committee. So good morning and thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, wonderful to see you all. Uh, for the record, my name is Sarah Squirrel. I'm the Commissioner of the Department of Mental Health. Um, I'm also joined by other members of our leadership team at the Department of Mental Health um, to provide an overview uh, related to many of the urgent and important topics in our system of care. So I'll just pause for a minute and let the other folks uh, from the DMH team introduce themselves. Great. Good morning. Uh, morning, Fox, Deputy Commissioner for the Department of Mental Health. Welcome. Good morning, I'm Shannon Thompson, the Financial Director for the Department of Mental Health. Welcome, Shannon. Good morning, I'm Allison Krampf. I'm the Director of Quality and Accountability for the Department of Mental Health. Okay. Welcome, glad to have you all with us. Great, thank you everyone. Um, so if it serves the Chair and Vice Chair and Ranking Member, um, I will share my screen um, and walk folks through our presentation. So I will start doing that. Now, okay, can everyone see that? Yes, we can. And so uh, nodding heads, wonderful, great. Yeah. Um, well, I will jump in. Um, certainly this week is an important week um, in Vermont for mental health. Uh, Monday was Mental Health Advocacy Day. Um, a little bit different given our virtual environment, um, but nonetheless powerful. 
Um, certainly a great way to kick off this week um, and to present this overview uh, to this committee. I think now more than ever, as the pandemic stretches on, um, the significance and importance of ensuring that we have a comprehensive system of care for Vermonters um, to access mental health care in a timely way is so important. And we have to ensure that when our friends, family members, ourselves, loved ones, children, um, need access to mental health care, that they can access it in a timely way and that it's high quality. So I will um, move through, uh, I guess we'll just pause for questions as we go, um, Representative yeah. Lippert, but I will take my cues from you on that. And, and if there's an obvious, if there's obvious break points to pause and take questions, maybe that's what we'll ask committee members to hold questions until the, there, there's, are there, yeah, I see that there's probably some obvious points to stop and take questions. Does that work? Yeah. Or? So you can see there's an outline of the presentation here. Uh, we wanted to be responsive to the request from the committee. Um, to, we'll do a, a broad overview of the mental health system of care. Uh, we'll dive deeper into inpatient capacity, planning for our DMH recovery residents, suicide prevention efforts, uh, Vision 2030 implementation, uh, some review of legislative reports and some high level recommendations, and we'll wrap it up with some initiatives and opportunities. So we could pause after each of these sections um, to take questions, um, which That's might be below. Uh, that sounds good. And perhaps along the way, depending as we go along, we'll just take a complete break for you and the committee oh. uh, so that we all get a stretch break. And because uh, sitting on Zoom, sitting in front of Zoom and in front of our computers nonstop is not good for our mental health okay. or physical health. Sounds good to me, thank you. Um, so first, just to start, obviously, um, related to the mission of uh, the Department of Mental Health, uh, we do take our role and responsibility very, very seriously. Um, and our broad mission is to promote and improve the mental health of Vermonters. And when we think about our vision broadly, you know, we really envision a system of care um, and an understanding philosophy um, way of approaching our broader health systems and health care that mental health is really a cornerstone of health. Um, and we really believe that there is no health without mental health. Um, and certainly, you know, we have a vision of Vermonters having access to an effective system, promotion, prevention, early intervention, treatment and recovery, um, and to support individuals um, to live, work, learn and fully participate in their communities. You also see here a visual of Vision 2030. Uh, this is something that we are very proud of as a department the system of care. Uh, we will be talking in more detail about Vision 2030 and our efforts to advance that work in terms of achieving a holistic and integrated health system. So I'm going to just walk through some overview points. Um, there are many seasoned committee members um, who have a great understanding of the mental health system of care, but I wanna make sure that um, all committee members have a good sense of the system and the components. Um, so certainly the Department of Mental Health, um, as I mentioned, we have significant statutory responsibilities uh, to Vermonters to provide comprehensive mental health uh, services and care. A lot of that work we facilitate with collaborative partnerships um, with other um, nonprofit partners across the state. Um, that includes our designated agencies, specialized service agencies, and designated hospitals. Um, certainly, we see our work as one of collaboration. Um, I often say that, you know, sometimes we think about our best way to serve the system of care is to optimize our part in it. I really think we have to optimize the relationships between the parts to get the outcomes that we're after. Um, so we really do value this collaboration with our community partners. Um, the designated agencies and specialized ser service agencies, we contract with them um, to provide services on behalf of the state that we are federally mandated to provide. Um, there's a significant designation, oversight, and authority that we take very seriously, um, but we're grateful to have such a strong network of designated agencies and specialized service agencies um, providing community-based care to Vermonters. We also work with seven designated hospitals um, who provide inpatient care to Vermonters. Um, we operate um, two facilities. So the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital located in Berlin, which is a 25 bed hospital, which is designated as level one. 
And then our Middlesex Therapeutic Community Care Residence, um, which is a, is a seven bed, uh, physically secure residential located in Middlesex. And we'll talk a little bit more later in the presentation um, related to our efforts to replace uh, that facility with a new state-of-the-art trauma-informed facility. In terms of staff at the department, we have just over 300 staff, uh, about 250 of them uh, work at our facilities. So working at the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital or working at uh, Middlesex. Uh, we have 61 staff at Central Office. We are a small but mighty team and our um, we have several units within DMH. They kind of align with other units in the Agency of Human Services, administrative support, business office and legal services, um, our quality research and statistics teams, uh, clinical care management team, uh, policy and planning, uh, child, adolescent and family team, and our adult mental health services team. Um, as I noted, we really value partnership and collaboration. So we have some notable collaborations here that we've listed. Um, and also um, Vermont um, has incredible community partners and advocacy partners that we also work closely with and support, um, inclusive of the Vermont Federation for Families, the Vermont Psychiatric Survivors, uh, National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI, um, Pathways, and many, many others, including peer advocacy organizations. Again, I mentioned this in, our, in some of my introductory uh, remarks when we think about a public health uh, spectrum um, and a continuum of care, as I noted, promotion, prevention, early intervention, treatment, and recovery. This is just another visual um, going into a little more detail on our designated providers. Uh, so you can see the 10 designated community mental health agencies listed here. Um, some you may be familiar with, those that are located in your own communities across the state. Um, the seven designated hospitals um, that we work with to provide inpatient care, inclusive of the Brattleboro Retreat, Central Vermont Medical Center, Rutland Regional Medical Center, uh, the University of Vermont Medical Center, Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital, um, the VA Medical Center, and the Wyndham Center. And the two specialized service agencies that I mentioned, uh, Pathways Vermont and NFI. This is a very colorful uh, visual of the designated community mental health agencies across the state. Uh, this is really just to give you a sense of how our DAs are kind of oriented across the state. They each have catchment areas, um, which are geographical areas that they're um, responsible to provide an array of community-based services to. So it just, just gives you a visual sense of um, the different designated agencies across the state. I would also just note that the two on the bottom here, um, Northeast Family Services, um, NFI, and Pathways Vermont as specialized service agencies actually provide services across the entire state of Vermont. Um, so I just wanted to note that uh, specifically for the committee. This is a visual overview um, to give you a sense of the adult system of care. Um, and you can see that we go from um, some of the most um, intensive um, services and supports that we offer across the state um, down to our community mental health um, agencies and systems. Um, so starting at the top, um, you can get a sense of uh, that these are our inpatient facilities across the state. Um, we have three level one inpatient hospitals or units, if you will. When Hurricane Irene um, essentially closed the Vermont State Hospital, uh, we created a decentralized uh, inpatient system for level one. Um, level one is also codified in statute. Um, there is uh, clinical definitions related to level one and how an individual um, might um, be admitted into a level one unit. Um, there's also specific language in terms of how we fund level one. Um, so level one is codified that the Department of Mental Health has to pay reasonable actual costs to those hospitals providing those services. Um, so essentially what that means for the Brattleboro Retreat, which has a 14 bed level one unit, uh, for Rutland Regional Medical Center, which has a six bed level one unit, um, there's a cost settlement process that we go through 
um, to ensure that we are covering the full costs of care um, for those individuals. Um, from a capacity standpoint as well, I'll be talking a little bit more about, uh, we have additional level one capacity uh, that will be coming online uh, with 12 new level one beds at the Brattleboro retreat. Um, would, would you be willing to very briefly actually help define what level one, what, what does level one mean? I think it, it doesn't have meaning for anyone who's not thoroughly uh, grounded in this system. It, yeah, absolutely. That there's other levels and how does this compare, you know, just, but what, what does level one mean for the... Uh, yeah, I can, I can start it off and then I think Deputy Commissioner Morning Fox could probably add more to that. It's a great question. Um, so really when we think about uh, clinical and safety needs for an individual um, that the Department of Mental Health, our care management team um, utilized is to determine if someone meets level one criteria. Um, so certainly individuals um, who are presenting with the highest level of acuity, um, whose um, current clinical presentation um, indicates that they, due to their mental health um, uh, experiences and challenges, um, would be a danger potentially to themselves or others. Um, and I will pause there and let Deputy Commissioner Morning Fox speak more to that. And, and maybe sure. in the course of that, uh, Fox, if you, if you could clarify, you know, is there a correlation between those Vermonters patients who would have been previously at the Vermont State Hospital versus general hospitals, or is that not necessarily a yeah. fair equivalency? I, I think that, that's relatively fair. Uh, I think that's, that's kind of how it's developed and grown to, to, at this point, uh, that I think most folks will consider when they hear, when you're working within the mental health system, Level one <clears throat> are those folks that would have in the past traditionally been Vermont State Hospital uh, uh, patients. Uh, it actually originally began, I believe, uh, partly connected to billing practices um, as we were decentralizing, uh, or maybe not. <laughs> not you telling me. I, I think, um, but I, yeah, I'm, I'm afraid. Well, let. This, this is part of the <laughs> challenge for us here is that uh, I think Representative Donahue actually may have originated the term in another committee at another point in time. So uh, it's a bit of a setup to ask anybody to explain it other than her. Sorry, sorry, Fox. And sorry, Commissioner. No, no worries. But but the, 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 the general construct is, you know, how it's how it's operating now uh, are those folks who have uh, kind of the more complex or higher level needs. Uh, we're generally looking at uh, uh, need for additional services that might be traditionally provided on a general psychiatric unit. Uh, and so it, it, it could include uh, needing one-on-one -on -one staffing or, you know, closer monitoring of that sort, uh, additional psychiatry support, uh, things of that nature. And so it's, it's, it's really for uh, those individuals that uh, uh, really kind of need a bit more support than what you might find in a general psychiatric unit. But, and so I think I'll just ask you a couple more questions just because I think it's important to understand for members, uh, this is not the equivalent of involuntary status. No, uh, you're exactly right. Most people, uh, the, the great percentage of people who are uh, on a level one unit are involuntary, but not always. Uh, there, there are people and there are exceptions when a, a voluntary patient can require similar, uh, those higher level uh, kind of care needs. But there's a large overlap then. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to, since I brought it up, I'm going to ask Representative Donahue if you would like to make any comment without taking us down too far into the history. Sure. Well, I think the flip side of your question, uh, Representative Lipper, is, of course, the vast majority of inpatient admissions are voluntarily, folks voluntarily seeking care. Yes. Then there's a subset who are involuntary uh, because they're deemed a threat uh, to self yeah, or right. others and are not accepting care. And it's only a subset then of those who are yes. um, most at risk and require additional staffing. Yeah. Um, and it was after we identified that as being a need for extra support that then evolved into 
um, the uh, billing criteria for meeting that threshold. To, that's why I was saying, well, no, it didn't start as a billing piece. Yeah, right. The billing piece evolved from it, but I think it's been well yeah. characterized. Yeah, I think that's, so I think we're, we're on the same page here. I just wanted to make sure there wasn't some sense that maybe that we were not. Thank you. Th thank you. Uh, I, I think that that terminology is one that I think often is a stumbling block for people in understanding the system of care. But thank you. I, 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 just to add yeah. one brief thing, the, re the reason, you know, why do you have level one without two or three, the intent when I find it was that there would be a two and three for those other categories that level two are involuntary, but who can be uh, placed at a, a regular inpatient unit and level three are voluntary patients. Those never caught on, but that's why it's quote level one. Okay. And I do want to just make clear too that uh, individuals, uh, if someone you know has one hospitalization and then at another point in time, another point in their life uh, requires hospitalization again, doesn't mean that they're always needing level one services. Uh, so I don't. I I want to make sure that the committee understands that individuals that may require level one treatment services this go around. If there is another uh, uh, need for hospitalization, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to need that same level of care uh, again. Thank you. Great question, Representative Leppert. Thank you, uh, Fox and Representative Donahue. Um, so uh, the next, I guess, tier here that we've identified um, within this pyramid, if you will, trying to provide a visual depiction of some of the capacity in our mental health system of care on the adult side um, is the secure residential, um, which I just noted. Uh, we will go into more detail on the secure residential, um, why it exists, uh, what the needs are, some of the specific legal parameters around that in terms of individuals who are admitted. Um, but it is a seven bed facility um, located currently in Middlesex. Um, and it is, does serve primarily as a step down uh, from the level one beds that we were just talking about. About 95%, I think, of individuals who are currently residing um, at the Middlesex Therapeutic Community Residence have stepped down from level one. We also have an array of intensive residential programs across the state. The acronym for that is IRR. We're trying to not use acronyms today um, and really just say and spell out exactly what we're talking about. These intensive recovery residential programs um, and residences are located across the state. Um, they are operated uh, primarily by our designated community mental health agencies. Um, and we really see them as a statewide resource. So that's just something important to think about when we think about the scale of Vermont, geography, where these are located across the state. Um, and we utilize them as a statewide resource. Um, of course, we always want individuals to access um, care and treatment as close to their home as possible. Um, but the IRRs we do um, see as a statewide resource. Uh, we also have a peer run um, residential program, which is the Soteria House uh, that Pathways operates as well, um, which is another part of our system. Then we have crisis supports and response. Um, so a comprehensive system of services and supports um, for adults who might be experiencing a mental health crisis. Uh, we have mental health crisis beds across the state again, operated um, by our designated community mental health agencies uh, for a total of 12 of those um, with 38 beds. And we'll be talking a little bit more about capacity and the impact of COVID on the capacity of some of those crisis beds across the system. Um, then of course, we have our community mental health system of care um, and specifically um, another level of support in the system are group homes. Um, so group homes um, for individuals who might need longer term care and support in a residential setting. Uh, we have 19 homes across the state, um, again, primarily operated um, by our designated community mental health agencies and specialized service agencies. They're a big part of the system of care. Uh, the Department of Mental Health also did, um, if you're looking for some additional reading, um, an analysis of residential bed needs um, across the state, um, which gives a very comprehensive overview of kind of current state and where some gaps are. 
um, group homes were clearly identified when we think about flow in the system as an area that we need to continue to look at um, for potential expansion um, to support Vermonters across the state. Uh, so I'm going to shift to the children's mental health system of care. Um, this visual uh, really gives you a sense of that continuum of care. When we think about promotion and prevention, um, early intervention, and then more intensive services and supports that children, youth, and families may need, um, I think that this visual depicts um, kind of our philosophy and fundamental values when we think about um, child, youth, and family mental health, which is that the children, youth, and family are at the center of our care. I would also note that, of course, whenever we are working with a child or youth, um, that family system um, is so integrated into the work, even though we might be coming in to support a child or youth because of their individual needs, um, we all know that there's probably complex interlocking factors within that family system, and we're typically working very closely with the adults in those child and youth lives as well. Um, we have many promotion and prevention activities um, across the state that we're currently working on, um, and I think this also um, does resonate with our vision around an integrated and holistic system of care in terms of trying to integrate um, more work with pediatricians offices, um, where are we seeing children, youth, and families, um, and how do we move more of our services and supports upstream. I think we would all would recognize that the earlier that we can intervene, the better the outcomes. Children are setting long-term health trajectories in their earliest years. We know the impact of trauma. We know the impact of adverse childhood experiences. Um, so the more that we can intervene in those earliest years, um, the better the outcomes in the long term. Then we do move into, I guess, uh, more of the intensive intervention or mental health supports that we offer. Um, I would highlight here our school-based mental health services across the state. Vermont has always been a leader um, and is a model that is held up by other states in terms of our expansive school-based mental health programs. Um, it really demonstrates a collaboration between mental health and education, which is critical. Um, essentially what this looks like um, is that our designated community mental health agencies um, provide school-based mental health services directly in public schools. Um, we're working, I think, in over 70% of schools across the state um, providing those school-based mental health services. And again, there's kind of a, a, a pyramid related to intensity of supports. Um, there's very intensive one-on-one -on -one services that are offered in public schools, as well as school-based clinicians um, that work with a broader caseload of individuals. Um, and then, of course, we do have alternative schools across the state as well, um, which provide an alternative educational setting that has more mental health uh, supports in it. Um, for children and youth where um, the public school setting may not meet um, all of their social, emotional, and behavioral needs. And then kind of up the spectrum a little bit more, we're looking at more intensive services for children and youth, um, including our residential services, which we'll talk a little bit more about, inpatient services. So all of our inpatient services are located at the Brattleboro Retreat. Um, so that includes beds for children, as well as beds um, for adolescents. Um, we do have crisis services, of course, for children and youth as well, and crisis beds across the state. So there are, we did want to bring some data into this conversation as well. I would just say that this is not the comprehensive art results-based accountability overview. Um, we do have a much more robust set of slides um, that we'll be providing as part of our budget testimony. But I did want to, you know, start to put some numbers um, to the system of care needs. Um, Representative Lipper, I thought Representative Houghton may have had her hand up. So I'm just going to she did, and I'm uh, using my judgment to uh, put her in the queue, but to let your okay. let your, your um, presentation right. continue. Sounds good. So I think what this slide really illustrates um, is just, and when we think about longitudinal data, this is a, a good span of longitudinal data going back to 1986 um, to 2018. Um, in terms of the increased need and demand for children's mental health services. 
Um, again, we know that there's a lot of factors at play here that impact um, child and youth mental health, um, whether it's poverty, um, parental mental health challenges, substance use, um, trauma. Um, we're also very good at identifying um, mental health challenges um, in children and youth, which is a good thing um, because that's exactly what we want to be doing. Um, but Vermont does have some of the, the highest rates in the nation of identification of children and youth um, with serious emotional disturbance, which is a terrible name, by the way. Um, <laughs> not strength space, but that unfortunately is um, the language that is used. So again, I don't want to dive too deep into too much data, but I do think it's important because it does start to tell the picture um, about Vermont and our system of care and need. Um, so we have uh, residential capacity across the state for children and youth um, who might need to access um, residential care and support. Uh, they could be accessing that from the community um, based on need, or they could be accessing residential programming as a step down from inpatient um, there is a lot of collaboration at the community level related to when a child or youth um, is deemed to need residential level of care. Um, so there's an intensive process that happens um, and thoughtful process that happens um, in collaboration with many partners as well as the family, of course. Um, what this data trend shows at a high level is that for the Department of Mental Health, um, particularly, we are seeing an increase in residential bed days, um, as well as children and youth who are accessing residential care. Um, I think that does speak to uh, some of the increased acuity that we are seeing in children and youth across the state. Uh, we're also seeing uh, very complex cases. Um, so complex cases, highly acute presentations, possibly children and youth that also have or are experiencing uh, developmental disabilities as well, um, complex medical profiles. Um, so again, we do continue to see uh, higher acuity and we have seen an uptick um, in the past year of children requiring uh, residential care. So that is a good place to pause. Great, and um, yes, let's pause there. Uh, I, I must say I have a number of questions, but uh, let's turn to other members first. Um, well, actually, I'm going to one one broad question. I'm going to I'm going to suggestion. Just th this is really helpful. Uh, if you if if you if we were looking at the the slides that show the designated agencies and specialized service agencies way, way back at the beginning, and um, there that I think that that's a, maybe a one place uh, you you list the number of full time or uh, the number of employees that work for the department and the inpatient units. I think it, it would add perspective uh, for people who again for unfamiliar. If mm. there was the full time equivalent staffing for all of the designated agencies, uh, which I think would astound people. Uh, and I think if there is a ballpark figure, I, I have something in my head that I don't know that it's close to accurate. Uh, I think. The reality is that most of the services in the state of Vermont are provided through the contracts with the community partners, rather than through the department staff. It sounds like sounds like the department has a lot of staff when you say 300 and some, but that includes your inpatient, the, the, the facilities that you're responsible for, as, as I remember. But the number for the staff in the community is in the thousands, as I recall. Yeah, that's exactly right, Representative Lippert, and that is such a good point. Um, and you'll but see. I, don't think, I think the impact of that is not as clear with when you don't, if you don't know the system. Uh, that so just just if if there is such a number, uh, it'd be great to share it at some point. And uh, I mean, I know there is a number. <laughs> yeah, it is in the thousands. You're absolutely right, and I know that Julie Tesler will be testi testifying shortly, and she can probably give you a more exact number. Um, but yes, you're correct, and you'll see when we do our budget presentation, over 70% of our budget goes to the community mental health agencies providing services. That is where the bulk of the services are happening, um, and it is certainly a number that is in the thousands. And I would just say that for the facilities, 
Um, those only reflect the staff um, who are at the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital in Middlesex. So also does not include all of the staff that are working in the inpatient units at the designated hospitals. Yeah, great. So it was just, as I was listening, I was thinking that's some perspective for people who yes. don't know the system. So I'm gonna turn first, I think Lori was in, in the queue and then we'll turn to uh, Representative Peterson, or Representative Burroughs and then Representative Peterson. Thank you. I just have a couple of questions on the children's slides. Um, I just want to clarify. So the slide where I think it showed 10,000 youth being served, that includes the youth that are being served by the designated agencies in the schools, correct? Okay. So the that trend sense? line that was going up in terms of the amount right. of children this served. One. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Uh, yes, I will double check. Allison is on with us, our Director of Quality and Accountability, but I believe um, that this number is representative of the children who are served in public schools as well. Is that correct? Yes. It is inclusive of that number. Thank you. And is all of that funding through the Success Beyond Six mechanism, or is there funding, and you don't have to go into it, it's some, you know, a, we can, that can be a later discussion, but is there funding separate from that that flows through the schools? Uh, so this is not representative of all of only success beyond six from a monetary flow perspective. Um, so we have children's services, uh, which is part of the case rate in DMH's budget, which I think off the top of my head is probably 26% of our overall budget. Um, and then Success beyond six is separate from that. Um, it is not included in the case rate. That is still a fee-for-service model. Um, and I believe that's about 25% of our overall budget. Um, so they are separate. Different. They are separate, yes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Representative Burroughs. Thank you. And <clears throat> excuse me, I, I apologize for not being able to turn my camera on, but it's okay. everything is really garbled when I, when I do. So we understand. Uh, uh, Commissioner, on this slide right here, I'm glad you have this one up. I was wondering what accounts for that spike in the year 2010, if you, if you know. Oh, Thank you. that is a great question. Um, I'm trying to think if there were any significant uh, policy pieces or otherwise, um, we certainly attribute, um, we have seen some dips that we have attributed to the DAs bringing on their new EHRs, but Allison, do you have any e sense? E EHR, please translate. Oh, electronic health records, thank, thank you. you. Um, so you'll see in our slide set next week when we um, go through kind of individuals currently served for the DAs, you'll have see a little bit of dip in children's services last year which we attribute to the implementation of the new electronic health records. Uh, but going back to 2010, Allison, do you have any insight into that? Yeah, I think this is one of those cases where it looks like a peak simply because when in actuality, it's kind of some normal ups and downs. And so you'll see some other places on this chart where it did increase just as much. It just so happened the next year to decrease just as much. And so we've looked at it. There really isn't any major indication of what that may be, except for some kind of cyclical, you know, a few hundred kids here or there coming in each year. Um, we, it doesn't line up with when we transitioned um, EMRs in that year, but we are expecting to see um, in 2019 um, a little bit of a dip because of that EMR transition. Thank you. Representative Peterson. Yes, thank you. Uh, Commissioner, since you have the slide up, I, I, I've got a couple things I wanted to ask about, but uh, of all the things I've seen in my month of being a legislator, <laughs> this is the, the, the scariest and most troubling thing I've seen. Um, when you consider that probably from 2008 on, our numbers of children have dropped. I, I'm, I'm guessing at that date, but our, our numbers are going down in kids and our, and our, and our kids with problems are going up. Um, this is probably beyond your purview here, but I, I am actually horrified by the slide that, that we are increasing that much in the needs of kids that have mental services. I-, I Mental health services. Pardon me? Mental health services. 
mental health services. Um, anyway, that's just a comment that, I mean, there's, that we could spend three days here just talking nothing about that. Um, I, the other question I had in, in the beginning, when Irene hit and you had to take, take all of the level one patients and move them around, what did that do to um, your budget for security? Things like, I assume some of those folks need to be secured or watched or so, so that, that function had to go to several different places. I'm in the Rutland region. I, I thought you said there was six beds in Rutland. And so are those places cordoned off? Did they have to build a separate thing? And, and would you prefer to have them back in one facility so they could be better served? Wow, all great questions, Representative Peterson. Um, going to your first comments, just briefly with the slide on children, um, I think you make a really good point. It came up yesterday in our testimony as demographics shift and we see declining populations. That may change as we go forward, um, you know, with the influx of individuals wanting to live um, and raise a family in Vermont. Um, and then we still see this increase. Um, and I think we have been consistently seeing increased need. If you talk to the folks from Department for Children and Families, um, Department of Aging and Independent Living, just across the board, we see more need. I would also say um, that we're also very good um, at identifying children and youth who have complex social and emotional needs. And that's a good thing. So while this number continues to climb, the fact that we're identifying them, we're wrapping them up with services, really bodes well for them and their families and their future. Um, so I just wanted to note that um, the only other little piece I would note is that um, Vermont was recently named number one um, in access to mental health care. Um, and part of that is because of the incredible access to health care um, that we provide to children. So again, I also think that we also just do a really good job of providing services to children and youth, which is also a good thing. Now, do, you get, do you get parental need, a parental uh, permission to, to serve these kids? Yes. Yeah, you do. Okay. And um, to your next question uh, related to um, the decentralized system, you know, I would say, and I would refer to others um, who were here and experienced that crisis, um, that having a decentralized system that is integrated more broadly in our healthcare system is the direction that we do wanna go um, in terms of inpatient care. Uh, that's a best practice model. That's something that Representative Donahue has been an incredible leader on in the state of Vermont. And from a security standpoint, um, those individual units within those inpatient facilities, whether it's at the retreat at Rutland or VPCH, um, you know, they're all designed to have the appropriate security, safety, environment of care components um, to ensure that we can meet individuals' needs, to keep them safe, and to keep them safe. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, uh, Representative Black. And then I'm going to suggest that we continue with the presentation. So, I mean, some of the questions that will emerge again as we touch on other parts of the system, I'm sure. But Representative Black? Simple question. I'm just wondering what the capacity was at the Vermont State Hospital before Irene. How many beds were there at that time? I believe it was 54. Is that correct? Correct. <laughs> and then we, we now have 45 level one beds, uh, Representative Black, and then we have um, 12 new level one beds coming online at the retreat. And Deputy Commissioner Morning Fox always speaks eloquently um, to some of the reasons and for that delta between the 54 and the 45. Thank yeah, you. When, uh, when Tropical Storm Irene came through, um, there were 54 uh, patients at the Vermont State Hospital. Uh, of those 54, there was a cohort of folks, half dozen or so, maybe a little more, uh, of folks who did not require hospital level of care per se, but due to safety needs and, and uh, clinical uh, issues had traditionally had been unable to be discharged from the state hospital. Um, and, uh, and so when, when the first 45 beds kind of decentralized system was, was put together, it was also in mind that 
uh, of the 54, not all 54 necessarily needed hospital level of care. And that also helped in uh, in 2012, which I'll speak about in a little bit, but uh, in 2012, an Act 79 uh, was passed, uh, which helped create uh, the Middlesex Therapeutic Community Residence or the Secure Residential. Uh, and so that residence was in part, part of its intention was for some of those individuals who no longer required hospital level of care, but because of their particular clinical needs and uh, uh, and, and such, uh, couldn't, had had not been able to be placed in the in the community. Uh, and so the Middlesex facility was developed as uh, that residence, and as well as working on transitioning those those folks uh, back into the community. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. At some point, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm aware of our time and we've got a lot to cover still. Uh, um, it might be interesting. I think it would be interesting to just have a historical perspective on what the Vermont State Hospital number of beds were. Uh, I think most people are not aware that it was in the hundreds, high hundreds. Uh, but that's that that some point we can delve into that. Uh, let's We're continue. A thousand. The, yeah, a thousand. Yeah, that thousand plus well over. Yeah. Wow. Right. It's like, and, and, and anyway, I, I think it's important for people to understand that when we look at what we're doing today versus where we've been. Uh, let's continue with the, that's, and here we are, we're talking about inpatient capacity. Uh, and uh, let's continue and let's hold our questions until the next time for a break. And then, uh, because we do have a lot of ground to cover here still. Great. Um, so this next section captures a lot, um, but it's all very important information and current trends. So we'll talk about in inpatient capacity broadly. We'll talk specifically about the impact of COVID on our inpatient capacity, uh, residential capacity across the state, crisis bed capacity, um, and wanting to brief uh, the committee on our planning um, for the new uh, secure residential facility. So those are the pieces that we're going to cover in this section. Uh, this is really simply an orientation slide. I, I recognize that it's probably hard to see all of the detail. Uh, we can follow up and send this as a PDF um, that you can essentially zoom in and expand. It's really just intended, this was part of our analysis of residential bed needs, um, to give you a sense visually of where our residential crisis bed and inpatient capacity is geographically located across the state. Um, this encompasses um, both child and youth um, capacity as well as adult. Uh, so a lot of information here. Um, you can clearly see where we have areas where we have a lot of resources. Uh, you start to see areas where we might have more disparate resources. Um, and also keeping in mind that some of our capacity across the state, we do see as statewide, um, not just regionally based, but I do think this is a helpful visual, um, so you can really get a sense of um, our capacity across the system of care. So this is a uh, chart that we include every year um, in our budget testimony. Um, I think it does, uh, it's a good starting point to kind of tell the story about our, um, our crisis beds, intensive recovery residential beds, secure residential, and inpatient beds across the state. Um, so on the very far side of this graph, you'll kind of see pre-Irene and where we were in terms of total number of beds, um, post-Irene, and then some of the gradual increases that have occurred across the state um, in specific areas. And then way over to the right, um, what you will see is our visual depiction of the decreased capacity that we are currently seeing um, across the state um, due to the impacts of COVID. Um, so we have seen, and albeit this is not permanently decreased capacity, um, but in the moment um, it does represent um, the availability of capacity, uh, both for our inpatient beds, our crisis beds, um, and some of our residential beds across the state. Um, I'm going to use this next slide um, just as another grounding point for us. Um, what this really shows, and this is a lot of detail, and I apologize, there's more acronyms on this um, than uh, probably there should be, 
but what we wanted to do was really show you the capacity of um, the beds that we have in our inpatient system, the current number of closed beds and current capacity. And I'm just gonna back up a little bit um, to talk a little bit about what happened um, when COVID hit the state of Vermont. Um, so certainly uh, back in March and April, when COVID first hit, um, it had a significant and immediate impact on workforce. That was probably one of the first areas um, that really um, became challenging for us. Um, as you can imagine, um, Vermonters in general um, possibly couldn't work due to their own health care concerns, due to their you know, needing to stay home and take care of their children, um, staff being anxious about COVID-19 and exposure. Um, and then there was a period of time where I think that financially it may have made more sense to collect unemployment versus coming into work. Um, so that had an impact kind of chilling effect on capacity in the system because without workforce, you don't have capacity. Um, we also simultaneous to that, uh, we also saw a significant reduction in demand. So between I would say March and May of last year, we saw a real drop off in terms of demand, um, particularly for inpatient. Um, and you know, the first email I read every morning when I wake up um, is how many individuals and who is waiting in our emergency departments across the state. Um, during this period of time, there were days where we had no one waiting. Um, we have never experienced that in the history of the Department of Mental Health. Um, so that just illustrates to you um, the impact on demand. Um, and again, that was not necessarily good news to us. If anything, it was worrisome um, in terms of individuals maybe not accessing uh, the kind of care that they might have needed at the time. Uh, there's a couple of, um, I guess, uh, ways that we might think about why that happened, which would probably be a question of some of the committee members. Uh, certainly at that time, we would um, hypothesize that individuals didn't want to go to emergency departments um, because they were fearful. Um, we also didn't have individuals um, out in communities as much. Um, so people were quarantining, um, not in public as much, maybe not coming to the attention of some of our um, community agencies and supports. Um, we were experiencing less face-to-face -face time um, with providers. Um, and at the same time, we've also, um, the Agency of Human Services um, stood up significant amounts of housing for individuals, uh, which we also think that those efforts around housing so many Vermonters also had an impact on demand for inpatient. Um, then in June and August, you know, as Vermont was kind of moving into more of a recovery period, if we can remember that, um, there was a period in time where we were seeing um, COVID cases decreasing, we were restarting, folks were more out in the community, we saw an immediate uptick in demand for inpatient services um, that somewhat made up for that lull and dip that we saw. Um, so we have more demand across the system of care and what you can see from this is we're also experiencing decreased capacity. Um, and that of course is very worrisome to the department, um, particularly when one of our priorities is timely access to care. Um, I would say currently uh, we have continued to see maybe a little bit of a leveling off from the um, peak that we saw um, over the summer, but still steady demand for inpatient. That overlaid against decreased capacity um, is something we're monitoring very closely because we worry a lot. And one of our um, proxies for how we're doing as a system are wait times in emergency departments. So we'll talk a little bit about that data as well. We actually have a report that we've submitted to you um, that gives more detail on wait times over the past year. Um, I would say that um, currently we are seeing um, an increase um, in wait times um, due to some of the decreased capacity that we're seeing across the state. So with that all said, what this slide is really meant to illustrate is what is the maximum capacity that we have across these units? How many beds do we currently have closed? And what is our current capacity? Um, so when you see BR, that's the Brattleboro Retreat um, and their units. Um, Brattleboro Retreat is our largest provider of inpatient services in the state. 
um, when COVID hit, um, and folks are also aware, simultaneous to the pandemic, the Brattleboro retreat was also and has been continuing to experience um, some challenging fiscal um, times as well. Um, so COVID hit, um, and uh, that certainly had um, impact for the retreat. They did have to take one of their units fully offline, which was their Tyler 1 unit. So when you see T1 enclosed beds, that unit remains completely offline. Um, I don't want to get dive too deep, but just so there's um, some awareness, Tyler 1 um, was their detox co-occurring unit. Um, and they've worked very hard to try to consolidate their staffing to the best of their ability, um, to prioritize high acuity, to prioritize involuntary patients, um, but you can you start to see the decreased capacity across the state. And even for our other partners, um, there were the staffing impacts as well as infection control. Um, so many of our inpatient units um, had to create quarantine units at the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital. Um, we have, I believe it's D unit that we have to kind of hold for potential quarantine space. So you see that reflected um, in the four beds who are closed uh, that are closed. Um, UVM and some of our other inpatient hospital partners. Um, also, there are some rooms that are double occupancy that had to be reduced to single occupancy. Um, so just to give you a sense of what the system was having to recalibrate to um, and we still have work to do. Um, we really need um, to um, ensure that our capacity comes back online uh, because we know that there is going to be continued to be um, increased need. Um, so again, this is just to give you kind of a visual of um, our bed availability, what's currently closed and current capacity. And then at the very bottom, um, we did aggregate together all of our statewide adult crisis beds. Um, so currently we have over 75% of those open, which is a good thing, um, but there were certainly times where um, that number was a little bit lower as well. Okay, sorry, that was a lot of information on that slide, but I think it's really important that the committee understands the impacts of COVID on capacity across the state. Um, this is a similar slide, but it's more focused um, on child's crisis and inpatient capacity across the state. Again, this is point in time data. Um, we do have um, a bed board um, at the state uh, that is can be accessible by anyone um, where we kind of track um, availability of um, beds and capacity across the state. Uh, so you can see at the Brattleboro retreat for their child's unit and their adolescent unit, um, they do have some beds closed um, due to staffing shortages. Um, NFI North and NFI South are two of our hospital diversion programs. Um, they have been able to ramp back up capacity, even though they've had some challenging moments and times over the past several months. Um, and the Howard Crisis Stabilization Program um, is back up to 100% capacity. Um, so again, I just want to acknowledge the incredible work of all of our partners across the state um, to grapple with the impacts of COVID, the stress of the workforce challenges, infection control, um, and really our network of community partners have just been phenomenal um, in working with the state to ensure that we can keep as much of our capacity open as possible. Okay, so that was a bit on capacity. I wanna shift now to talk a little bit about the future DMH recovery residents. This rendering is not the current Middlesex Therapeutic Community Residence. Um, for anyone who has visited it, um, they would know that um, it is uh, two trailers um, that have been um, strategically put together with a fence around it um, that was put into place post Hurricane Irene. Um, so I'll just give a little bit of background on the current um, Middlesex Therapeutic Community Residence. And then we're excited to share a little bit more about where we're headed in terms of the future DMH recovery residents. Um, but essentially, um, this is also uh, related to Hurricane Irene, that part of um, our recovery efforts around Hurricane Irene uh, were to establish the Middlesex Therapeutic Community Residence. I believe it was probably um, 2012, if I have that correctly. Is that right, Fox, 2012? Yeah. 
Can, can I just interrupt a second? Are we going to come back to be able to talk about, uh, we were talking about inpatient capacity and, and what the current availability is and, the, and waiting. Is that, is that coming up later or is this the time to ask those questions? No, if you'd like to pause Representative Lippert before we jump into um, the Middlesex Therapeutic yeah. Community Residents, I think that would be just fine. They're all kind of part of the same section here, but we can- yeah. And I realize we're trying to cover a lot, but, but I, there's a key question that has been raised in a number of settings with myself and some others, which is the dichotomy between, uh, well, I'll just put it out there. Uh, Spectrum Youth and Family Services has raised concerns that they have referred children to the hospital in uh, to the UVMMC and who they felt were highly suicidal and to have children, have them be uh, first deemed not sufficiently at, at risk to require inpatient hospitalization, but simultaneously told that, and in any case, we don't have any beds. There are no beds for children available in the state. Uh, and simultaneously, I think some of us have been told that there are unoccupied beds at the Brattleboro Retreat. And so uh, they've, they've, so I'm, I'm raising this publicly because they've raised it publicly and said, so which is it? Uh, we're told there are no beds and other, and I have represented to them that we've been told that there are beds at the Brattleboro Retreat that go unoccupied. So, and, and, and was part of some of those same conversations. So maybe you could yeah, I, I think when we, uh, a little bit of the follow-up that when they talk about children, their population, Mark, but the spectrum was actually saying a lot of this is, you know, potential 18, 19 year olds. They're not the children in terms of adult, their transition age youth um, and including, um, you know, including some level one. Um, and I keep, I keep forgetting that piece. So thank you, Representative Donahue, for clarifying that. That may be part of what the conflict is. Yeah, so thank you, Representative Lipper. I do appreciate that. Um, there's probably a couple pieces at play there, and we would certainly at the department welcome um, any conversation uh, with Spectrum about concerns yeah. that they may have. I think there um, should be some. Yeah, I have not heard directly from them uh, myself. I'm looking at Deputy Commissioner Morning Fox, so we would welcome them to outreach to us um, to have a collaborative conversation about how we can improve access. Um, so yes, there certainly at the community level, um, there is a process by which um, a child or youth is deemed to meet hospital level of care. Um, so that process takes place. There are screeners who are trained. They work with the community mental health agencies to do that. Um, and certainly sometimes there are different perceptions. Um, on whether a child or youth meets that threshold, but that is a, a clinical decision that is made. In terms of the capacity piece, I would say um, very honestly and transparency that capacity is tight, um, you know, because of those, some of the workforce needs and trying to staff those units. Um, I am aware that there has been some bed availability. Um, so I guess I just wanna make sure that we understand what the demand is um, what the barriers are, and to work, of course, in partnership with the retreat um, if there is um, needs that aren't being met, uh, particularly for children and youth. So perhaps we could have a, uh, let me flag this as a conversation that I think is important to have, and we'll have it at another time, but I think, and perhaps to engage with community partners who are expressing this concern to some of us as legislators. So yes, let's, we, we, we would welcome that conversation because it's been raised on a number of occasions now. Okay, thank you. Of course. Let's continue, I think. I, yep. Okay. So back to the current Middlesex um, Therapeutic Community Residence, I was giving a little bit of an overview in terms of the, the history components of it, um, which it was actually um, created through Act 79, as I was thinking it through in 2012. Um, it was designed um, as a step-down facility for those who no longer needed inpatient level of care, perhaps getting to some of Commissioner Fox's uh, comments earlier. Um, and it was built um, using FEMA funds. Um, and it was built um, under the understanding that it would be a temporary facility. 
Um, anyone who has visited the facility um, can clearly see that it has outlived its lifespan um, and needs to be replaced. Um, and we also uh, have a recommendation that in uh, addition to replacing the current Middlesex Therapeutic Community Residence, um, that we actually expand the capacity um, of that residential program to provide more care for Vermonters. So I wanna just give the committee a little bit of a sense of where we are in terms of the process. I think that was one of the questions that was asked of the department in preparation for this, um, a little bit on the timeline and the work to date. Um, so this is a capital uh, project on behalf of the state of Vermont. Um, so in the last capital bill uh, process, uh, we were provided um, with a capital bill allocation of $4.5 million um, to begin the work uh, to really identify a site um, for the future uh, secure recovery residents. Uh, so that was work that we undertook with our partners at the at BGS um, to find an appropriate site um, for the current residents. Um, that was an extensive process um, that did take into consideration uh, several key factors. Um, and we were happy um, to be able to identify um, an ideal site from our perspective, um, which is the uh, formerly known as Woodside site and facility located in Essex um, as the future home of um, the new recovery residents. Um, there is also a whole lot of um, implications related to IMD requirements, um, institutes of mental disease, again, really um, uncomfortable language for me, but that is how it's referred to. Um, and what we've been trying to do is of course, um, just to talk a little bit about that, um, there are um, guidelines around what federal funding um, can and can't be used for IMDs. Um, the current Middlesex Therapeutic Community Residence is not considered an IMD. Uh, which is a good thing um, because it allows us to continue to utilize federal funding um, for the facility. Um, but we do have to be very thoughtful about where the um, future physically secure recovery residence is located. Um, and so the Essex site really ticks a lot of those boxes in addition to it being state owned land um, that really allows us to advance the project um, on an expedited timeline, um, which certainly there is a sense of urgency for us. Uh, so now that we have the site selected that's been agreed upon on behalf of the legislature as well, um, we will not be utilizing um, the current uh, Woodside facility. Uh, that is a correctional facility. It would be absolutely inappropriate um, for any kind of therapeutic care as we go forward. Uh, so we would essentially be demolishing um, that building and building anew. Um, we have um, been working on schematic design uh, related to the building. So what you see here is just a current rendering of what the exterior of the future recovery residence um, could look like. Um, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. Um, and of course, um, stakeholder input has also been a critical part of that process and will continue to be as we go forward. For the committee members, I'm just going to say that uh, this is a place where our committee uh, works collaboratively, or well, actually the lead is the institutions committee because it's a capital project, because it's a state owned project. Uh, and our committee has asked for input to their work. And I, and I, yeah, I'm just thinking that given all that we have to cover, I, I wanna be careful not to get too deep into this project right now. I think maybe we should move quickly through this or even go past some of this to other key pieces. Yes, that, that happy to do so. Um, so again, the next slides really just underscore basically what I've already stated, um, some of the history here um, in terms of um, the residence itself. Uh, what we're trying to accomplish in terms of a true system of care, as I mentioned, 95% um, of the referrals to our current secure residential are from level one units. So when we think about flow in the system, um, it's not just about inpa more inpatient capacity, it's ensuring that we can actually transition those individuals to lower levels of care appropriately in the community. Um, so expansion of this facility 
will really help us um, accomplish that. And we, of course, want individuals to step down as quickly as possible who no longer require hospitalization. Again, this is just to give some high level renderings of the direction that we're going in terms of um, the design, you know, really being intended to promote recovery um, uh, for residents. Uh, so again, we'll just breeze through these. Um, this gets into some of the clinical models that we'll be looking at, um, and then just the guiding principles to a trauma-informed approach. And we can come back and do a deeper dive into that project, but I know it was a request. Um, it was, but it's my judgment that we that was good to fast forward there. So thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, um, another area, oh. Uh, I think we might be due for a five minute break. Let's take a five minute stretch. Uh, go off screen, so committee members, please go off mute or mute yourself, go off video, take a five, we're gonna do a five minute stretch. Let's continue and we're gonna turn our attention with the commissioner and staff to the important area of suicide issues, suicide prevention and addressing prevention issues, efforts. Thank you. Great, yeah, thank you, Representative Lippert. And I am actually going to turn it over to our Director of Quality and Accountability, Allison Kronk, to walk us through this section. Good morning, everyone. Again, for the record, Allison Croft, Director of Quality and Accountability. Um, I also, as part of my role at the department, um, have been the lead for suicide prevention efforts. Uh, my background is as a crisis clinician, um, and it's something near and dear to my heart. And we wanted to start off by letting you know what's happening in suicide prevention, um, both within DMH and at AHS um, in general. And so you may be aware last year, um, there was a bill going through that had some suicide prevention um, initiatives within it. And so when we had the opportunity for COVID relief funds, um, what we did was we looked at that bill and what it was trying to do and, and essentially um, tried to fill that with as many things as we thought would approach the issue um, of suicide prevention that's specific to COVID um, relief. And so what we know with the pandemic is that it is increasing risk factors. And some of those risk factors are economic depression, isolation, um, altogether stress. I know if you're a parent trying to work and um, teach your children, it's extraordinarily stressful. And then we have our older Vermonter population who is already at higher risk, who are now both um, have increased stressors due to the concern for physical um, issues with COVID, but also being really unable to connect in ways that they might've been able to before. So those were all things we were thinking about when COVID relief suicide preventions came as an option. And so I wanted to talk about, we'll show you some data um, in the next few slides about how things have looked historically and how they're looking right now. Um, but before that, I wanted to give you a sense of, of what we've done thus far. So we did take the COVID relief funds, um, 500,000 were provided. And one of the first things we did was we said, we know what works and what works is zero suicide. So we did apply um, a great deal of that funding to the zero suicide initiative. And if you've heard that term a few times and it still feels a little bit vague and intangible to you, I'll give you an example of what the funds were actually used for. So zero suicide is a public health approach and it has pieces of everything, of the entire spectrum that you would need to prevent suicide. So that includes building awareness in communities of how to talk to your neighbor, your child, your sister. It also includes making sure that if someone is identified as having suicidality, that there are trained folks who they can go to through a warm handoff that's not just, you know, here's a bunch of phone numbers that know how to address suicide, suicidality, suicidal ideation directly. It used to be that we really tried to approach it by um, addressing depression. And those two things are not exactly the same thing. So we've worked really hard to make sure that if it is identified that the DA system in particular has trained staff who can address suicidality in an evidence-based way. So with this particular funding, we knew that folks might not necessarily be able to get to the doors of designated agencies. So we put out mini grant opportunities for primary care offices to partner with their mental health agency networks and create a pathway to care. So that if someone came to the primary care office, 
that the folks in that primary care office knew how to identify suicidality, were asking about it, and then had a plan with their local mental health agencies of who they would call and how they would create a warm handoff. So we had 17 primary care practices participate in this mini grant opportunity um, and paired with five different regions of the designated agencies. And it is something that they did a, a whole lot of work prior to December 30th, which was the initial um, COVID relief funding deadline. We've also put money forward and from general fund to continue that work through to July. So those folks are still meeting and we've created a really great partnership and we've leveraged the Blueprint for Health to assist us because we also know it's not necessarily just everybody needs immediate professional help. We wanna, through a therapist or ongoing lengthy therapy, we wanna make sure that if some folks feel more comfortable in their primary care office, we have, there are people embedded in those practices who can help and provide brief treatment. And so we're making sure that all of those options are available and really pushing the message that um, certainly some su suicidality requires inpatient level of care, but not all. And we think folks can be successfully treated in the community if we have people who are able um, to ask the right questions and know how to handle those situations. So that's specifically what we accomplished and are still working towards for expanding zero suicide using COVID relief. The second piece there is expanding the suicide prevention lifeline. We're gonna talk a little bit about that in the next slide because that's the 1-800-273-TALK number you might've heard about. It's the National Suicide Prevention Hotline. However, it is intended to be answered in state. And the goal with that is to make sure if a Vermonter calls that number, that it's not just a conversation and that it ends, that the person who answers the phone actually knows what are your resources in state, um, who can you talk to, um, and everything from getting them economic supports. Um, it's not just about therapy. And so we have worked to increase our ability to answer those calls in state. Our NCSS up in Franklin County has become a lifeline certified center. So they were already answering those calls pre-COVID. We used COVID relief money to expand their hours. So they were able to expand into evening and weekend hours answering the phone for folks calling the lifeline. We also were able to bring on board another agency. We want to, we're moving towards 24 seven coverage in Vermont of the lifeline. So Northeast Kingdom um, was able to be onboarded using some of these funds and they're continuing to work towards certification as a lifeline member. The third piece is targeted resources for at-risk groups. One of the things we do understand is if you stand up what I might describe as, you know, some vanilla medical model um, approaches, it's not gonna be welcoming to all people. So one thing we, we're becoming more aware of and we still have work to do is making sure that these, um, all of these initiatives are accessible and are speaking the language of folks um, literally and figuratively across Vermont. So we've been working, um, the Center for Health and Learning is building some educational modules for all of us, including providers, including people who would answer the lifeline just about, um, we're working with our um, refugee populations and the health equity group to make sure that we have language options for folks who may not be English speaking. We're also working with Outright Vermont to make sure that um, the way that we're marketing these and, and the folks who answer the phone are welcoming and accessible um, to the LGBTQ plus community and know the resources that would also be welcoming to those folks if they need a referral. Additionally, looking at the BIPOC community and we making sure we have referral lists that have folks who are people of color so that um, we are making sure our resources are really diverse and comprehensive for everyone. And then the other pieces to that in terms of targeted resources for at-risk groups, we know we have increased suicidality amongst older Vermonters we know we have increased suicidality amongst veterans and individuals with disabilities. So we are working with the disability community, VA, um, and um, Dale to look into how we can make sure we're reaching those populations in particular. We always have an eye on youth. Through this process, we are concerned about some of the increased suicidality that has been shown in the Youth Risk Behavior Survey as well as I'll be showing you some data that shows an increase in suicide deaths for youth. 
we have applied youth mental health first aid. And one thing I do want to note, and we've received some feedback over the last few years of concern about mental health first aid as a model, that it may be pathologizing to medical model. So I did want to note this new model that has been employed this past year has been updated. It is specific to teens and youth, and it is about having more peer-to-peer -peer interaction, peer-to-peer -peer support, while also highlighting that at some point you may need to reach a trusted adult and you shouldn't be handling that on your own. But it is something that we're keeping an eye on to see how this new model is received so that um, we can keep, keep our eye on, I think that some of the criticism is, you know, treating folks as if, if you have a friend who might have a need, all of a sudden you're pathologizing them and identifying them with a diagnosis and someone who needs treatment. And we're really trying to make sure we normalize the fact that youth, no matter who you are, it is extraordinarily normal to have these thoughts at some time in your life. And we don't want that to be the message. We want it to be the message that there's lots of different ways to get help. And so again, we'll be evaluating this new model um, with an eye for that going forward. Then the fifth piece that we utilized CRF funds for is expanding our um, elder care clinician program. This was a big concern right off the bat, like we talked about with older Vermonters being isolated. There is a specific program where we have clinicians going out to the homes of vulnerable um, older Vermonters who might have mental health conditions. And this funding was used to make sure that the folks who are going and going at times might be um, virtual, but money was spent on making sure we could help older Vermonters know how to connect virtually, um, provide PPE if someone did need to actually go into the home, um, as well as making sure the people going to those homes really understood how to assess for suicidality. The other piece I wanted to note about COVID relief funds, we did provide uh, Pathways Vermont with $200,000 to um, work towards a 24 seven operation of the Warren line. And we do see that as a very important suicide prevention effort. Um, the folks who man that line uh, answer a lot of calls from people who are experiencing suicidality and we believe that peer model works very well. So $200,000 went to that as well as an additional um, $60,000 from the SAMHSA emergency funding um, that we hope to maintain through July 1st to be supporting that effort. The other piece I wanted to note, so that was COVID relief funds. That was sort of what can we do fast um, that, we, that we think could hopefully really prevent um, a spike in suicides, which we were concerned about with when COVID began. I also wanted to highlight that at the same time, we were awarded um, in partnership with the Department of Health, a $3.8 million CDC grant. And this um, was just such an incredible opportunity because it allowed us to play a little bit less reactive whack-a-mole and a little bit more, um, how do we take all the things we're you know, piecing together right now and build them in a sustainable way. And so for this grant, the grant does sit in the, Department of Health, we are we were able to squeeze a 0.5 halftime communications person that's going to be focused on how do we reach folks who might be at risk for suicide in a way that we haven't been able to before. And it is really looking at a public health approach to suicide. So we're building infrastructure. And I would say the best way to describe that is it's less about just how do we make sure mental health providers know how to treat suicidality and instead, how do we make sure Vermont knows how to talk about, address, report on, um, have the data that we need, and make sure that anyone who's having a touch point with someone who might be struggling would know how to address it in the moment. So I'm gonna speak a little bit more about the CDC grant on the next slide. I wanna note that we're calling it Vermont Addressing Suicide Together. So when you hear more reporting on this in the coming years, it'll be referred to as VAST. And right now we are in the beginning stages of identifying partnerships with the goal of creating a much more coordinated statewide prevention effort. We've had lots of great work happening in pockets all over Vermont. We're really looking to build a team that can work together um, and has an eye on everything that's going on. Another piece to this is using data to identify vulnerable populations and serve them better. And I would highlight one of the problems we have with that 
Um, sometimes we don't have the data we need to know if certain populations are more vulnerable. For example, we don't have any data that can tell us if someone who died by suicide did identify as LGBTQ. Therefore, we can't track if it is disproportionately affecting the LGBTQ community. We have a similar issue with the Abenaki population. They are not recognized federally um, as a Native American tribe, and therefore, we aren't able to see that in our data. However, anecdotally, we're aware of higher clusters in that population. So those are some of the things we're gonna be working towards and that's where the Department of Health is going to be very helpful. That's their wheelhouse. Um, they work with the coroner's office on gathering this information and putting practices into place so that we can get the information we need. Another major focus is going to be on health equity. Um, if you look at any of the youth risk behavior surveys or um, adult risk behavior surveys, we know that um, underrepresented populations are disproportionately affected. And therefore, we've got a lot of work to do on how to reach them, how to include them in all of the processes from how we message to um, how we treat. And I think um, one of our jobs right now is figuring out who needs to be at that table from the beginning to inform all of those processes. I would highlight that the goal for this entire grant and one of the performance measures we are actually beholden to is to decrease suicide deaths in Vermont by 10% and decrease suicide morbidity by 10%. And the morbidity piece means attempts um, and suicidal ideation. We look at that through visits to the emergency rooms and crisis visits. And what we know is the morbidity issue, folks who are extremely distressed, feeling hopeless, suicidal um, and attempting are more predominantly female and also fit some of the rest of the data we have on health equity, disproportionately um, people of color, LGBTQ, disabilities. Um, and so we have a lot of work to do there. However, when it comes to suicide deaths in Vermont, we have another target population that we really need to focus on and it's white males in rural Vermont. The vast majority, even this year, it's 82% are male. And it's, this is a national issue. Nationally, more white males in rural communities are dying by suicide. Vermont is even higher than that in terms of the proportion who are actually um, dying by suicide um, versus attempting. So one of the big pieces of work we have to do is how do we reach that population effectively? Um, we're feeling most who are dying by suicide are not in care and did not have an identified mental health issue. So the last pieces here are we have a lot of work to do to expand recovery and peer support groups. And we have some great partners with that, um, with Pathways and with NAMI, and we're working to expand so that if someone is lost from suicide, right away we need to wrap those families, we need to wrap those communities, and we want to make sure that people know where to go and that there are peer-driven supports for that work. So we are looking to develop that over the next few years with these key partners. Another major issue that I think the committee should be aware of, um, because it's going to be an interesting development um, nationally and in Vermont, that 1-800 line I talked about is shifting to a three-digit number in 2022. So instead of being called the 1-800-273-TALK line to reach the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, it will simply be 988. And with that transition comes a lot of pieces to be worked out in terms of how do we make sure that we are um, effectively messaging to folks, when would you call 911? When would you call 988? And if you call 988, um, are we, do we have the infrastructure, the staffing and everything that we need to make sure that those calls um, are answered 24 seven, ideally in state and have good referral options, um, both peer and treatment um, across the board. And so again, wanted to highlight that the expectation is these calls will be answered in state and we are working towards this aim with having NCSS currently answering the phone and NKHS is about halfway through their certification process and we're hoping they'll be up and going by May of this year to answer those calls. And 
current status is we're putting together a 98 planning coalition. An invitation will be going out in about the next week with a broad group of stakeholders. And we do need to include state police and our dispatch folks. Um, it will impact. Right now, one of the goals for this is we wanna divert people from the emergency room if the emergency room is not appropriate. And if you call 911, Right now, it's hard to divert that. If you call 988 and you're able to, someone's able to talk and can meet their needs, that diversion could happen. So we wanna make sure we're doing that in a safe way. So we're partnering with the state police, with NAMI, um, with the Federation, with Pathways, and then looking also with our groups that are representing um, underrepresented populations, such as the Refugee Mental Health Work Group. And through that, we, we are using a small planning grant that we were awarded um, from February 1st to September 30th this year that will help support the hours it will take to um, meet with all of these stakeholders um, and, and do this important but difficult work. Thank you, Allison. Before we move into the data slides, which um, I'll defer to the chair in terms of um, how deep we want to go in the data. I just want to acknowledge, um, you know, the impact of loss for family members, um, for communities, um, and just, you know, our empathy and understanding of what that means for families um, to lose a loved one uh, to suicide. And certainly it has been our priority and the priority of the governor to make sure that family voice um, is a part of this work. It's a big part of the suicide coalition um, that really drives um, a lot of this work and energy and effort. Um, the governor held a round table last year of which, you know, um, parents and family members, you know, really were in the driver's seat in terms of what are the needs, what are the gaps, what was missed. Um, so I just want to underscore that as being just a fundamental value to our work. Um, and certainly an area that you know, we all take very, very seriously and, and understand the ripple effects for communities um, and the devastating impact on families. So uh, I, I'm unfortunately, because of the way I'm organized here, I don't have access to your slide deck right in front of me to see where we're headed uh, in terms of more information around suicide prevention. But I, I see that there are a number of committee members who are eager to ask some questions. And I'm wondering if we might just field some of those questions first. Uh, again, I'm aware of the time that we have. I should say that I've spoken with Julie Tesler there to, to see if we can have her testimony uh, continue at another time as well. Uh, but we're, we're, we have a lot of, we're trying to cover a lot of territory here this morning, uh, more than is probably have been realistic. But this is an important issue. Uh, but without getting, we could set aside a, you know, another, we can set aside additional time for this at a later time, but let's field some questions. I know Representative Black had her uh, hand up to get in the queue, uh, then Representative Page, uh, Representative Donahue and Representative Golden. I think uh, Representative Chin is also kind of in line. So there's a lot of, this is, let me just say, this is an issue that has touched many members of our committee in our personal lives uh, and our professional lives. And so this resonates in many, many ways. So let's, let me go turn first to Representative Black, then Representative Page. I actually would like to get through um, a couple of the subsequent slides, because uh, I do have questions on a few of those. So okay. I'll defer to anyone else who'd like to ask I, a question. I wasn't quite sure. Yep. Okay, Representative Page, then let's, let's, let's try to, yeah, Representative Page. Um, yep. <laughs> I just want to recognize it must be extremely difficult to build this infrastructure and uh, and and to start just basically from scratch. But one item I do want to bring up, and, and maybe it's been raised with you before, the term "vast," the acronym. And I'm not being glib here, but you know the Vermont. There is another vast association of snowmobilers, something like that, and. You know, I know you've put time and effort into building this, this program and you've got your name all set and the acronym, but you really should maybe reconsider using that acronym. So that's just my thought. Thank you. Thank you for Thank your you. comment. I was unaware. I appreciate that. Thank you, Representative. Right. Uh, Representative Donahue. 
I'll just say that that struck me immediately as well. It's an extremely well-known acronym around many parts of the state. I just also want, I just wanted to foot bookmark something, not for now, but when we address the budget next year, I was concerned to say to hear that the Pathways Warm Line uh, funding was prioritized through July 1st. So I'm looking forward to hearing uh, where it fits into next year's budget proposal, but not today. Thank you. Representative Goldman. Uh, thank you so much, Representative Lippert, and for your presentation. Um, I, of course, am disturbed, as we all are, about hearing these data about 82% of white men. Um, no, 82% are white men. Yeah, 82% of suicides are white men. Let me get that right. Um, sorry. Um, and many of us who have been touched by it personally, as you said, myself included. Um, there is uh, legislation coming forward about a 48 hour gun waiting period. And I'm wondering if the department has any thoughts about that in terms of in uh, reducing this statistic. I can certainly speak to what we've um, testified on this before, and then I'll, I'll defer to Commissioner Squirrel in terms of, in terms of you know, official department positions. Um, we were a part of the testimony when this issue came up in the past, and we have testified around um, the importance of means restriction. And so um, from our perspective, means restriction across any type of means, so firearm, medication, um, when we meet with folks who as a crisis clinician myself, it's one of the first questions we ask and it's the most important because it is the difference between an attempt with survival and most 92% of folks who attempt do not go on to die by suicide. It really is a lot about means and access to means and type of means that ends, um, that can really make, be the deciding factor of it being a death versus an attempt. So I would just highlight that thus far in the work that we've done, we're really we are not, um, we don't change policy. We have taken some focus on what we can do. And one of the things we really pushed this year is counseling on access to lethal means. And that is about having those conversations. And one of the things that if you look at research, um, as it turns out, many um, primary care providers are not comfortable or will identify themselves as not being comfortable having those conversations with patients um, because many are not gun owners themselves. And so we're doing a lot of education around, let's just take the politics aside. How do you have a conversation with someone who does own a weapon and is going through a mental health crisis? And can we um, make sure that we have a plan for who can hold on to that weapon during this time? And so that's been our focus um, this year is how I would answer that. And then I invite, of course, Commissioner Squirrel. Yeah, I think Allison, um, you have captured it in terms of, you know, the department's previous position and, and how it all relates and is another aspect of our suicide prevention efforts um, specific to the waiting period. Um, I think we'll have to circle back to the committee um, once we have an opportunity to review the current bill, um, but could share more um, specific to Representative Goldman's question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so let's uh, let's take a look at the rest of, let's continue through the presentation. Uh, again, being, trying all of us to be aware of the time as well as the material that we want to try to cover. Yes, I think these next few slides will only take a few moments. Um, and knowing, our... knowing that Representative Black wants to uh, raise some questions following the review of these slides. We'll Thank come you. back to her. Leopard. Um, so what you're looking at here is an illustration over time of the rate of suicide deaths in Vermont. We have had a concerning increase in this rate over the past 10 years. And over the past five to six years, we've hovered around 30% higher than the national average for suicide rates in Vermont. We've also been increasing at a higher rate than other states. We were encouraged to see a dip in 2019 after three consecutive years of increases. However, um, the overall trend is increasing. And it is something that is deeply concerning and um, one of the reasons for our full commitment to increasing and expanding the efforts going on in Vermont. 
the next slide will drill down into this a little bit. So one of the things I want to note that what you just looked at is official published data that the Vermont Department of Health gets through the National Violent Death Registry. This is what we're looking at is something we've put in place in partnership with VDH um, as more of an informal. So I just want to highlight that these are not final. Um, this is not final data and it could look different once um, 2020 is fully wrapped up. However, it was really important to us when COVID hit that we keep a pulse on this month by month. So this is a monthly report that the Department of Health has generated that looks at how we're trending this year in terms of suicide deaths in comparison to the three-year average. We are you know, certainly encouraged that some of the stressors folks are going through this year did not appear to cause a spike in suicide deaths thus far. However, obviously these numbers are too high um, and we are working towards the philosophy of the department is zero. Um, but we are watching this uh, month by month and wanted to highlight that as of November, the year to date, we were um, at 105 losses in Vermont due to suicide versus 106 as the three-year average. We, so we are expecting um, by the end of 2020 that it is pretty close to average this year. And certainly I would just note, this has been a theme for us at the Department of Mental Health. We are expecting some of the peaks for the mental health crisis to follow some of the peaks from the health crisis. And so I think there was sort of a stunned reaction from folks for a few months that we saw stymie access to care and folks not seeking services and that's, um, that's going away. And so we're really keeping a close eye on 2021 as well. And the next slide just digs into this, that exact data you just looked at, but breaking it out by age and gender. And you will see what I was speaking to earlier that there are significantly more males lost by suicide every year. And this year was no exception um, in 2020. And we had more older Vermonters um, and younger Vermonters who are disproportionately affected um, as well as males. So I know Representative Black may have had a question, but those are the data slides that we have for you today regarding this issue. Great, thank you. Representative Black and then Representative Chena. Um, so first of all, I was just wondering what was the total number of suicides in 2019? I have been unable to find that data anywhere. And here you just have the rate dropping to 15.3. Yes, and that's a good question. They haven't published it yet. It usually comes out. Um, Sorry, right my dog. Now. <laughs> that's okay. Um, <laughs> I can circle back with you on that because we certainly were looking to provide the latest um, data as well. And it comes out and officially from the Department of Health. And I think they were working on it this week. Um, yeah. So I just want to make sure that I have the official number for you, which is a uh, comes due formally. That was another thing is that the Department of the Vermont Department of Health hasn't actually updated um, their I guess you'd call them their total metrics around suicide since 2017. I think that was the last year that they did in depth with, you know, um, attempts, hospitalizations. And I'm wondering when that data will be updated as well. I um, know that their group um, that normally does that work did get pulled for COVID. And so we've been in talks lately about how we can make sure that both are being prioritized. Um, so I think that is why there was a delay. Um, again, I, we have a partner over at the Department of Health who I would know to ask and could get some further information for you. Okay. Um, you know, obviously we do know that um, white males um, have the highest rates of suicide. Um, and we know why Vermont has a higher than normal rate of white males with suicide because we know that gun ownership correlates directly with um, suicides. So, I mean, uh, that's why we know that we're higher. Um, I'm wondering, you made mention of, um, physicians and not having comfortable conversation around um, reducing access to lethal means. Um, I just, 
I just would like to point out that I actually have a bit of an issue with that phrase because I think that phrase is designed specifically to make an uncomfortable uh, conversation more comfortable because when we're talking about access to lethal means, we're really talking mainly about firearms, not that there aren't other methods. Um, and I'm sorry, I had one other question. Oh, I know. Um, so in 2019, in June of 2019, VPR updated their gunshots project. Um, and there is a mention in that June article um, from you specifically that um, the Department of Mental Health was working on additional programs um, to address specifically suicide and gunshot deaths in the state. And I'm wondering what has happened with that and what programs have you been working on in the last year and a half on that? And when can we see something? That's an excellent question, Representative Black. We are, um, we have a list of folks that we're looking to um, connect with. So as part of our, I need to think of a new name to call it now that I understand the best has a different application. Part of our CDC grant is, is to reboot that work. We did have some successful partnerships with gun shop prod, um, gun shops in the past. And I will be frank, some of those partnerships fell apart um, as some of the um, policies were being pushed forward and, and people feeling like there was a time where they couldn't work with us on this anymore. And we want to fix that. And we do have, um, we've been working with folks who already have connections with them to bring us back into the fray. So they will be on our committee for the CDC grant. It's just a question of whom. And that's the piece we're working on right now is, is who specifically can raise their hand to say, you will join us with this. I have a few contacts who have expressed um, absolute interest in this. And I think I'm, I'm feeling really optimistic we want to be back in, in gun shops with promotion of how do you identify someone who's come in to purchase a weapon? And if we want you to be able to feel comfortable asking questions about the intent without applying judgment or anything like that, but those are important questions to ask. And I have enough stories that I have heard where those questions were not asked. Um, and in, in, in looking back, gun shop owners wished that they had. And we want to provide them those tools. And I think they want those tools. It's really getting some of the, you know, if speak frankly, the politics out of the way. And we're committed to that. And I would like to make a commitment to show you some of that effort um, as they join our committee. Um, and if you'd be interested in knowing who that those contacts might be, I would be able to provide a list in the coming months. I actually would, because I um, haven't, really been able to find very much information on the gun shops project. I mean, I know it exists, but frankly, other than having printed material hanging randomly around gun shops, I'm not quite sure what exactly it entails. Great. Well, let's come, let's, this is, this is very important and let's come back to it in, in addition at a, when there's more opportunity as well. Does that, I'm not, not wanting to in any way cut you off, Representative Black, but I just want to flag no, no, no. For further, further time with the committee. No, I was done. Okay, great. Representative Chena. Yeah, I have some questions just about um, the numbers that <clears throat> we're hearing that most um, of the people who died by suicide were white males. And I'm just curi curious, um, the relation of that number to the general population and what the disparity exactly is. For example, if I, I believe it said 86% were white males, but 46% of, I'm just saying that if that's the wrong number, I'm just using it because I'm not looking at the slide. So forgive me if I got that wrong because I saw some head shaking. So I'm not, I'm not trying to claim I know what the number is. I'm just trying to make a point about the context of the number, okay? So if hypothetically the number was 86% of the deaths were white males, but 46% of the population were white males, that shows a huge disparity. You know? So I'm curious in relation to what the general population is, what the number is, 
we, if we can get some more info or that over time. Another example would be like when looking at the suicide rate for black indigenous or people of color, if the overall deaths by suicide is 10% for BIPOC, but BIPOC make up only 2% of the population, that's a huge disparity. Even though they're only 10% of the 100%, if they're only 1% of the population, it's a huge disparity. So what I'd be curious to see is just some more comparison of the numbers in the, showing the context and showing the disparity um, to help us as we make decisions. Um, so that would be just down the road, it would be helpful. Um, and then I'm also curious about other factors for the white males, because lumping all white, all white males into one group may not be fair. Like how many of those white males are LGBTQ and how many do you, would you even know? Because how many people who are closeted kill themselves? Like there's a lot. So just putting that out there, having lived through that myself. And, uh, and what's the socioeconomic piece? Like what is the socioeconomic situation for those white males? Um, are they predominantly white males in poverty? Or are they predominantly wealthy white males who lost their money when the hedge funds got, you know, taken down? You know, like what is, you know, what, looking at that piece, you know, not making wanting to make assumptions about who that is, but just seeing if we can get more info um, about like the sort of what social determinants might be influencing the suicides. Um, I'm also curious. I'll just two more things. I'm curious about what the the impact of the pandemic has been on the numbers in 2020 and. I'm also curious about the intersection of over, overdose deaths and suicides, because um, there is sort of a, an, a Venn diagram where they intersect, where sometimes people will intentionally overdose um, or they'll engage in risky drug use, pushing the limit, knowing they might die and they might be suicidal. So even though it wasn't a planned suicide attempt, that it was uh, there was a suicidal behavior connected with the overdose. And so I, I'm just putting that out there because when we look at that that group of white males, I actually think there's a lot of factors involved. And I didn't see that in the slides and I'm hoping over time we can learn more um, because I think knowing those um, knowing those factors can help us help people better. So I don't know if you have any more info based on that, but it's sort of a question for the future or a request for the future if you don't have it now, thank you. And, and I'm going to just, I'm gonna suggest that there's a lot of questions you've raised there Rightly so, uh, I would add veterans to that list uh, for white males, um, clearly high risk group. Uh, there's a lot to, uh, there's a lot more to come back to on this. And um, it, I'll just restrain myself around LGBTQ youth and adults. It's, it's incredibly painful for those of us within the LGBTQ community who are acutely aware of the incredibly high level of suicidal ideation from many people who are not visible in any way. The rest of the population thinks it was had nothing to do with anything. And we know from our personal experiences that many, many LGBTQ individuals go unidentified because of the pressures even today to not reveal uh, sexual orientation or, um, or trans issues that not just sexual orientation, we tra trans people are at high risk, very high risk as well. So there's a lot here. And as I said, uh, this has touched many members of our committee in very personal and profound ways. And so as you can see, and rightly so, there's a great deal of interest and a great deal of expertise actually. Uh, no, uh, well, expertise and, and uh, available support for thinking this through. I, I, I would take all of these questions in the, in the direction of how can we do better? How can we do more? How can we be successful? Uh, so let's, let's, I, I'm going to suggest that we move on at this point, uh, but that this be uh, an invitation for all of us to find ways to do more collaboration on behalf of all the people that we all know and love. Thank you, Representative so, Lipper. Um, and thank you, Allison, for for taking the taking the lead. And and I, I guess I want to be really clear. I don't see this as any of this is directed. Uh, I mean, we, the, we all know there's a lot more for us to understand and a lot more for us to be successful at. So thank you. Agreed. Thank you all. Okay, so uh, Representative Lippert, I will um, continue and we do 
uh, you know, this is the, the strength of our Vermont legislature, as you said, Representative Lippert, we have a wealth of um, thoughtfulness, um, expertise, um, and we really do see this as a collaborative effort. So I think there's lots of follow-up to be done and we really appreciate um, the committee's uh, great questions around this. So we'll follow up formally and we might actually wanna schedule some additional testimony yeah. that can focus on We'll find, find a way. Yeah, of course. Okay, so I'm going to move us forward. Um, Good. Could I ask, could I ask you, could give me a sense of the, remind me of the number of modules that we're about to try to cover. I, yes. I apologize, it's hard for me to juggle on my devices all of the, but it was very well laid out at the very beginning and, uh, and I think. Yeah, <laughs> uh, so we have um, Vision 2030. Uh, wanted to orient the committee to the existing work that's happened, where we're headed next. Uh, and then we have just an orientation to legislative reports, some very high level comments on those reports that can be as short as it needs to be. Um, and then just some high level initiatives and opportunities um, that we're looking at. So kind of three, three topic areas. Okay. <laughs> so I would like to suggest that we aim to get through those three topic areas in the next 20 to 25 minutes, uh, given that that's a challenge, but that so that we can give uh, Julie Tesler at least the opportunity to begin to describe and talk about the community-based system of, of mental health care. And I would think that, uh, I know that Representative Donahue may, uh, she's yeah. articulated a number of reports, but I'm gonna suggest that that, that that section we come back to. Okay. Uh, yes, that certainly um, makes sense to me um, if it works for um, you, Representative Lipper. That's going to be my best judgment at this point in time, trying okay. to move this train forward. <laughs> right. Just just naming them will help just without discussing them, will yeah. help the committee frame yeah. a reference. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's a good, a good point. Okay, um, so I want to make sure that the committee um, uh, is oriented to Vision uh, 2030. Uh, I also uh, want to thank uh, Vice Chair uh, Donahue for her um, incredible leadership in this arena, um, really pushing the department um, to think about where are we going as a system of care and helping us articulate kind of the, the value and impetus behind this, which is really moving us towards an integrated and holistic healthcare system. So I just want to thank Representative Donahue for her leadership and support on this. Um, so. Vision 2030, really what we wanted to do was step back and take a comprehensive look at where are we going as a system of care? Um, because you know, if we don't know what our end state is, then we don't know what our first steps are. And we have a lot of work to do um, to truly achieve a holistic and integrated system of care. Uh, we also wanted to ensure that this work um, really was representative of the voice of Vermonters. Um, so we had a very, very extensive listening tour um, that we took place in, uh, that we um, facilitated, um, I think it was maybe the year before last now, um, in terms of executing this, uh, where we fanned out across the state. Uh, we set many community tables where we had diverse perspectives, individuals with lived experience, peers, direct care workers, um, our healthcare providers and partners really coming to the table expressing you know, what has worked in the system of care and how do we build on those strengths? And then of course, where are the gaps? Uh, what could we do better? Um, here was my experience and this would have made it better because it's the delta between that that can really motivate us um, and move us towards change. Um, we then took um, all the high level themes um, needs that were articulated through the listening tour. Um, and then we brought that to a think tank um, and that think tank was, again, it's a representative design process where we bring the diverse voices of many perspectives together. Um, I do believe that the diversity of our perspectives is truly our greatest strength. Um, we really look at moving something like Vision 2030 forward. Um, that think tank did some very intensive work over several months um, to arrive at and deliver Vision 2030, which is what you see here. Um, Unfortunately, with the impact of COVID, um, it did uh, have us have to unfortunately hit the pause button a little bit on some of the next implementation steps related to Vision 2030. 
um, but the department's um, commitment to this um, and excitement in getting back to the work of implementing Vision 2030 is a top priority for us as a department. And I wanna thank everyone um, who has already contributed a significant amount of their time and energy to achieving that. Um, so again, this really is just, um, I guess, underscoring uh, what I just stated in terms of how do we have an actionable plan to achieve an integrated and holistic system of care. The stakeholder engagement and involvement was absolutely critical for, critical for us. And how do we weave this together into actionable strategies? Um, so we have a vision, we also have a plan, and we have strategic short-term, mid-term, and long-term action steps to help us get there. These are the eight action areas. I was going to go into them in a little bit more depth, but I think that might just be too much detail for right now. We will probably follow up with the committee just to make sure that each committee member has seen the full report. I would invite you all to review it and read it. Um, there may be opportunities for DMH to come back and do a deeper dive into these areas. But these were the mm -hmm. eight action areas that were synthesized essentially um, by the think tank of areas that we really needed to focus on, um, including broadly you know, promoting health and wellness, influencing social contributors to health, eliminating stigma and discrimination, expanding access to community-based care, um, enhancing intervention and discharge planning, expanding peer services across the state, ensuring service delivery is person-led and working on workforce <laughs> development and payment parity. What I will also say is that the department is really using this as a guide for how we evaluate and target deployment of resources. Um, so to give an example of that, uh, we have a mental health block grant fund um, of which we have a you know, fairly typical annual allotment that we get from the federal government. We also receive sometimes um, somewhat has haphazard and sporadic increases. We use these action areas to guide and use in terms of our decision-making hierarchy where we're prioritizing resources and targeting resources. So this truly is a plan that we are utilizing to inform decision-making at the department as well. One of the key next steps um, that I wanted to highlight, um, and again, want to thank Representative Donahue for her leadership around this, um, is creating um, and um, implementing uh, the Mental Health Integration Council. Um, so there was legislative language that was introduced and passed last year um, to ensure that we move forward um, the integration of our systems together. Um, I'm trying to be careful about not just saying that we need to kind of fit mental health within healthcare, but probably that we really think about a holistic system of healthcare. Um, this integration council is going to be critical to get us there. We need our healthcare partners at the table side by side with this, with us when we think about integration. The integration council, I think, provides the kind of structure and governance that we need to advance that work forward. Um, we were, this is just the actual, some of the statutory language itself. Um, so, our, I'm sorry, <laughs> I, mean, oh, I think okay. we can just keep moving through the language, so. Yes, of course, right, the only thing I, I didn't know I was off mute. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Uh, I think the we're only, just trying to move us along. <laughs> yes, uh, the only thing I would just note there um, <laughs> is that we did delay the implementation of the council Obviously the engagement of healthcare providers is critical and everyone is still really in full pandemic response. So I wanna thank um, the chair and vice chair of the committee. Um, we will be um, starting that uh, council um, up in mid July. So I won't go through all of the legislative charges here, um, but certainly you get a sense of the spirit and intent of what we're trying to accomplish in terms of full integration. Okay. So the next um, area that I'm gonna move on from Vision 2030, again, there's a lot there. Um, I can go through this very, very quickly. Um, I know that the committee is interested in what are the impacts of COVID right now on the system of care and on Vermonters. So I just wanna highlight a few things very briefly. There's a lot of follow-up to be done here and a lot of work that's happening. Um, I just want to note that when we talked about our residential system of care, our crisis beds, our inpatient system, 
you know, a lot of the requirements around social distancing and quarantine have been very, very challenging to implement. Um, many of our facilities and residential programs were not designed um, to have quarantine space or to facilitate um, social distancing. Um, so again, that has just been something I, you know, really accolades to our um, system of care partners who have worked on that. Um, but certainly that has been a challenge. And just the, the nature of an individual who might be stepping out into a residential bed um, and being isolated in your room um, would certainly not be what we would be thinking about in terms of, you know, therapeutic steps towards recovery. Um, so just acknowledging that that continues to be a challenge, um, certainly with the deployment of vaccines across the state as we move towards recovery, um, that is an area we know will continue to improve. Um, I did want to make a note related to the um, mental health needs of children and youth, particularly as we've pivoted to a more remote um, deployment of educational services. Um, we know that many, many, particularly at-risk youth, um, there is a risk to not being in school. Um, there is a risk to not being able to access comprehensive mental health services and supports. Um, there is a risk to not being able to access, you know, nourishing relationships with your teachers and your guidance counselor um, and other school-based mental health folks. So we do remain very concerned about the impacts of remote learning um, on the mental health of um, children and youth across the state. And as has already been mentioned, even before COVID, we were seeing um, significant concerning data related to, um, particularly with adolescents, increased depression and anxiety. Um, and so this is just an area that we're continuing to focus on and working very closely with the Agency of Education. Um, also just our school-based mental health programs across the state have done an absolutely incredible job of continuing to provide services through telehealth, um, through community-based services, to try to continue to ensure that those children and youth are still getting their needs met. Um, obviously, there's access gaps in the system that we worry about now in terms of decreased capacity that we already talked about. You know, co-occurring is also something um, that we need to focus our attention on. Um, we certainly know that, and we are seeing an increase, particularly in individuals who are presenting an inpatient um, with very complex co-occurring issues, um, including uh, substance use. Um, again, there's a lot of work that's happening in partnership with ADAP, uh, but I think that's an area we have to consider, continue to focus on overall wellness and well-being. We know Vermonters are reporting the impacts of COVID on their mental health. Um, we know that there's, um, you know, not having trouble sleeping, increased alcohol consumption, general stressors, um, which is why we've stood up COVID support Vermont in partnership with Vermont Care Partners as a resource, um, but certainly something we're worried about. And then workforce. Um, we were already experiencing workforce challenges pre-COVID. Um, certainly the impact of COVID um, has really exacerbated some of those challenges. Again, this is an area that's been really articulated in Vision 2030, um, but we cannot take our foot off the gas in terms of continuing to think and problem solve around strengthening our workforce um, across the system of care. Um, and I would just note that, you know, we've had some advances to, you know, um, the ability for us to pivot to telehealth, um, I think does bode opportunity down the road in terms of expansion and access to services. But I would also just say that telehealth doesn't work for everyone. It will not meet everyone's needs. Um, so while telehealth will allow us to advance access in certain areas, um, I just want to recognize um, that for many individuals, telehealth might not be something they're comfortable with, might not have access to broadband services, um, and so there still are a lot of limitations there um, that I just want to know. Yeah, and we're, we are actually focusing, have been focusing a great yes. deal of time on telehealth issues, great. so thank you. I'm going to skip this slide in the interest of time. This is federal funding and grants related to our children's um, system of care, but I will um, move through this. I do want to just note some of the current federal funding that we have. We have our FEMA Crisis Counseling Grant, which is um, the funding we've used to stand up COVID support Vermont. We have our emergency SAMHSA grant that Allison referenced. That was a $2 million grant that we split with ADAP. We did just find out we have an additional $2.8 million 
Um, so we'll be looking to continue to expand emergency services and peer services, which is where those funds have been targeted. We already went into detail on the comprehensive suicide prevention grant. We do anticipate some continued increases to our mental health block grant, um, additional increases to suicide prevention efforts and possibly increases for project aware. Um, these are the slate of reports um, that the Department of Mental Health is required to provide to the legislature every year. Um, I'll just do a high level overview of what those reports are. Um, we can certainly provide more follow-up testimony in terms of some of the recommendations um, and what is the data telling us. Um, Act 79 um, is one of our, our larger reports. Um, it does really describe uh, the use of services, capacity, individual experiences of care, um, person and recovery evaluated performance metrics of the mental health system as compared to national standards. Um, I would encourage anyone again um, to take a look at the report that we recently submitted. I think this recent report articulates some of the complexities of shifts in our system in terms of capacity and other impacts. Um, and it tells the story a little bit behind some of the anomalies that we've seen this year um, and how does or doesn't that inform and influence how we move forward. The next report um, is Act 114. Um, this is an important report. Um, this is a real important piece of accountability um, around the utilization of involuntary medication for individuals across the state. Uh, I can say at a very high level that the report does not indicate any significant change in terms of the data around court ordered applications for involuntary medication. Um, and actually we saw by moving to virtual hearings, there's a whole very complex legal system that we have in place for individuals who are involuntarily um, receiving um, care under the care and custody of the commissioner. Um, and actually we saw easier engagement in some areas by moving to virtual um, uh, court proceedings. So that's somewhat highlighted in the report. Again, I would encourage folks um, to take a look at that. It is a short report, so it's easy to digest. Um, Act 140, I would just note, um, there's a significant provision of funding that was provided to the Brattleboro Retreat in an effort to stabilize them that also came with more accountability um, related to um, quality metrics. Um, so there is a report that we will be providing on February 15th um, that articulates um, specific areas related to uh, patient quality of care. We've been working very closely with Vermont Psychiatric Survivor, Survivors and Disability Rights Vermont on that report. Um, so you should see that coming soon. And then Act 200 um, is data on inpatient um, access um, uh, to inpatient units. Uh, emergency wait times, et cetera. So again, I would strongly suggest that DMH and VAS come in to do some follow-up on that report specifically because it got, does get into trends in terms of admissions, emergency department wait times, which again are really important proxies, I think, for the system of care. Um, and that again is something I think that we should focus on. Um, and then there's the Act 200 IMD report, which gets into... Um, the need for Vermont to phase down um, uh, our uh, funding um, for um, the IMDs, um, which at this point, the IMDs in Vermont are Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital and the Brattleboro Retreat. And I believe, one last slide. Um, this is just looking ahead in terms of some of the areas and initiatives that we're focused on, many of which we touched on today. The 12 new level one beds at the Brattleboro Retreat, the replacement of the current Middlesex Secure Residential, mobile response for children and families, we'll get to dig into at our budget testimony, um, continued implementation of mental health payment reform. We talked about um, Vision 2030 and just advancing a more equitable mental health system for all. Um, we also have some opportunities, I think, related to um, expanding community supports. Um, peer respite and crisis services um, is an area of priority for the department um, in terms of thinking about how do we really meaningfully um, expand um, those services and supports across the state. 
And then we, of course, always need to continue to turn our attention to geriatric psychiatry and needs across the state. Um, so I think that's the end. <laughs> Thank you for your patience and stamina. I know it's a lot of information, but uh, we really did want to give you a comprehensive overview of the system of care and the work that's happening. Representative Donahue. Uh, I wanted to make note for committee members is that we did specifically um, ask the commissioner not to get into two other issues that we'll want to come back to. One of them we worked a lot on last year about um, mental health police support issues and there's a report back on that that'll be coming and the other is the whole area of follow-up with the Brattleboro retreat so right. Right. We, we've set those to the side for now for now um, so are there I saw a hand uh, I'm looking for uh, Representative Goldman did you have I saw your hand up and then maybe it down and went, went down and I think okay. I was my question. Okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Page? Yes, I don't know whether Commissioner Squirrel can address this, but can you talk about Northeast Kingdom Human yes. Services? Yes, thank you. I was I made a note earlier that we really need to know. And, and yes, you, and you, its you. current status on its rating system. And I will also mention your picture of Vermont. And I've mentioned this to you before. Um, for the DMH residential crisis designated hospitals, um, you have a blank spot in Orleans and Essex and Caledonia counties. And I don't have to go any further. You, you know that um, there's limited resources there compared to the rest of the state. But thank you very much. And I look forward to hearing your comments. Yes, thank you, Representative Page. I greatly appreciate that comment. And that's, I think, the power of the visual of that report as well. Um, related to Northeast Kingdom Human Services, I'm very happy to provide an update as the committee is aware, um, based on feedback and input um, that the Department of Mental Health had been receiving over the past year. Um, we did initiate an additional agency review uh, for Northeast Kingdom Human Services. We have a designation process it's a very robust and in-depth process by which we designate um, the community mental health agencies. Typically, that's an every four-year cycle. Um, we do, if concerns are reaching a certain threshold, have the ability to implement an additional agency review at any time. Based on the level of concern that was coming to the department from community members and staff, we did implement that additional agency review. The result of that was um, significant findings in several areas um, of the overall agency um, met the threshold of being so concerning that we did um, move NKHS um, into a different designation status, um, which is a provisional status with intent to de-designate. Um, we immediately started working very closely with the leadership at Northeast Kingdom Human Services. What I can say is that their board of directors was so responsive um, to um, the concerns articulated in our additional agency review. Um, folks are aware there has been a change in leadership at Northeast Kingdom Human Services. Uh, we have been working side by side with them and their leadership team and clinical team. Um, part of the process is that they are required to submit a corrective action plan um, to the Department of Mental Health. Um, we then have 30 days to review um, that corrective action plan. Once that corrective action plan is approved, that basically lays out the groundwork of next steps, and then they have six months to implement it. What I can say is that Northeast Kingdom Human Services has submitted their corrective action plan. Um, we feel that it does materially address um, many of the deficiencies and concerns um, that were noted. Um, we will be um, at some point um, in the future um, uh, officially approving that corrective action plan, and then we'll be working side by side with their board and current leadership to advance it forward. Um, so I think we are on the right track. And again, we have a lot of confidence um, in how seriously they are taking this and that the agency um, will get back on solid footing again. Representative Page, is that address your question? Yes, 
Yes, yeah. thank you so much. I really yeah. do appreciate yeah. it. I guess I would ask one, other, if I if I may, I would ask one other follow up uh, or question, which is, I mean, one one can only assume that there were consequences for patient care in the process of the deficiencies that had come into play, because otherwise they wouldn't have been deficiencies, I would assume, unless they were primarily financial. And even that can lead to patient care deficiencies. Can you comment on whether there have been additional steps required to ensure, uh, to, to remedy any patient care deficiencies that had impact on particular uh, groups or individuals? Yes, um, there were significant um, areas related to service delivery um, and patient care um, that was uh, of a concern um, that we took into account in moving them into this status. Um, part of the corrective action plan um, does really address um, the deficits and some of the areas related to patient care. Um, Allison has actually been leading that work. Allison, is there anything that you would add specifically to that that might give Representative Lippert a bit more information? Yes, I would just add um, the nature of those issues were not what we would call critical incidents. So we weren't receiving issues of safety concerns or um, you know, assessments that were, were causing concern around the, the safety and care of clients. It was more along the, the area of staff and community voicing, we are getting to a place where we are concerned that might happen. And part of that issue was having the appropriate licensed folks um, and the amount of folks and the support from the leadership. And so just to be clear, um, we, we didn't have critical incidents that required a specific um, follow-up due to safety concerns. It was more about preventing that from happening. Okay, that, that is really part of what I was trying to understand. And Thank you. Um, Representative Peterson. Yes, thank you. Um, just more of a comment and, and, a, and a question here, I guess, a little bit. But uh, I want to share uh, Commissioner Squirrel's uh, concern about uh, uh, our school kids. Um, you know, you had a slide up and we talked a, a little bit about- uh, could, could we take the, the slide down just so I can see the committee? That, that would be helpful, thank you. Sorry, sorry, Art, to interrupt you. No, no, no problem. Um, you know, about the mental well-being of our kids in school. Uh, and I just wanna point out and remind everyone, I sent a petition around about encouraging the governor to restart high school sports. To those kids who have been practicing since December, the end of December, to not have games and to and to still be practicing, I think we need to give those kids hope. So I just would encourage anyone that wants to, any legislators, to uh, email me and let me know if you want your name put on a petition to try to get the governor to give him some some thought about maybe reopening games like New Hampshire or Massachusetts have. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We have covered a lot of territory here this morning and, uh, and I think profitably so. Um, I'm going to, I, I don't see any uh, hands right at the moment. Uh, I know we'll come back and we're gonna have an opportunity to hear from Sarah, Commissioner Squirrel around budget issues in particular. One of the areas of course that comes immediately to mind and she's referenced it, but in more detail, when we hear the budget, it's like, so how are we going to address the gaps in this system? What, because we recognize there are gaps in the system for all that we're providing, there are still gaps. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll certainly be coming back to that at another time and deal with budget questions about that. Um, I think it's my, again, <laughs> My best judgment right now is that we should take a break. And then during that break, I'm going to consult with Julie Tesler and with Ann Lurie. Uh, my thought right now, my, my preliminary thought is that we probably adjourn for the morning. I think we may have maxed out our ability to take in information profitably on Zoom and that uh, I'm going to work with Julie Tesler to make sure that the, she and uh, care partners, I believe we have 
actually some time that tomorrow we can schedule and I've consulted with her, but during the, if we, if we may, let's take a five minute break during which I'll do that consult and then we'll come back and we'll clarify our next steps. In the meantime, I really want to express my appreciation to Commissioner Squirrel and Deputy Commissioner Fox uh, and Allison in particular. Shannon, we didn't get a chance to chat with you, but maybe that's just as well from your point of view. <laughs> uh, but seriously, appreciate you being here. And the work of the department is so crucial. This, this, and, and again, to ground this in, this is the healthcare committee. And this is, as we have articulated numbers of times to, to our colleagues and to the public, we share the point of view, I think, of the Department of Mental Health, that mental health is an essential component of healthcare. It is not something that can be addressed. Healthcare cannot be successful without addressing all of these components. So I, and there are other better ways to express it, I'm sure, but this is, this is, this is important for us in thinking about the well being of Vermonters and the healthcare of Vermonters. So thank you so much for your work. It is hard work and it's an important work. So let's take a five minute break. If you wouldn't mind checking back in in five minutes and we'll make our plan from there. Okay. Thank and you I everyone for your time that, this morning. Thank you. Thank you. So yes, we're all back. Okay, can you hear me? I don't know why. Oh, it's it's the phenomenon of all of you are on mute, which is appropriate. And I I'm like feel like I'm operating in an empty box with no sounds. It's just the funniest thing. So take, oh, take yourselves all off mute. I'll feel the better. We can suddenly. hear you. We can hear you. We're just we've been trained to be silent at this point. Like I know, I know. You're doing exactly what I would have asked you to do, but it's just there's something odd about it. No, and no, no, represent. Representative Goldman had her hand up from before we broke. So I think she has a pending question. Okay. Okay. Uh, Representative Goldman. Um, yeah, uh, my question was actually for the mental health team um, who are now off. Yeah, they um, yeah, sorry, I missed that. Apologies. No worries. Um, but I'd just like to get it onto the record yeah. so that you can think about it. Sure. Um, on slide 33, they talked about the quadruple aim and vision 33 with mental health integration council. It's really impressive work. Um, what I wanted to know, is there parallel work going on in the department of health? Um, how, do, how do these two you know, pieces of health integrate you know, in a larger system? So that's what I'm, my, I'm curious about. Well, I'm going to turn to our vice chair who appears to want to comment on that. <laughs> The 32nd answer, and we can talk a lot more later or offline, is that that was the reason the Integration Council was created, was to say that mental health can't work on this alone. And so that I think it's like, like co-chairs between DMH and VDH in terms of the council. And, and that, that was the whole purpose. Everybody's got to be together working on this. Yeah, I'd like to see more of that because the slide didn't really imply that. It seemed like it was right. very siloed. So that's a curiosity of mine. Yep. And it, just, just to say, give it, you know, when we were lots of, we really need to acknowledge the COVID overlay on everything we heard today. I mean, it was referenced a number of times, but even, even, um, uh, my mind's going blank, but uh, someone we had, I think there was a reference. Oh, I think uh, Representative Black had asked about some of the work around gun shop issues. I believe, I believe I'm remembering the connection here. And one of the comments was that because of COVID, uh, everyone in the Department of Health was frankly redeployed. I mean, at, at some level, I mean, many, I don't know if everyone, but virtually everyone, plus people from other departments were brought in and redeployed to just address COVID. And so a lot of things which otherwise would have moved forward, including what made me think of it, including the Department of Mental Health's convening the 10 year, uh, the integration council that Representative Donahue just referenced several times we've been requested and agreed to without question, uh, deferring the beginning of the implementation of just bringing that council together because all the people involved are just dealing with COVID. And we said, absolutely. Uh, so we, we really do need to take that into account. 
as we listen to many of the, everyone from the community level to the impact on workforce in the institutional, at the inpatient level, uh, and, and, and what, you're, what we're talking about right here. Yeah. I totally understand and obviously yeah. totally get no, it. But it's a great question because it, it highlights what, as Representative Johnny said, the Integration Council was, was in fact, uh, in part or in large part, in, intended to do just what you're talking about. But there's a lot more to be done. And I find myself asking questions uh, about the fact that we don't usually have the Department of he Health come in and testify, and we need to. Uh, because they're often seen as the jurisdiction of the Health Human Services Committee, but we're we're a work in progress in terms of how we work collaboratively, and there's more opportunities that we will create for that. Thank you, Representative so, Lippert. I, I just would like to say, yeah, I'd like to see the same thing for the Department of Health, if that's possible. Yeah. So let me say, I did consult, and we, we're 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 going to finish up. We're we're finished up, <laughs> uh, and I and I mean that in a, in. Uh, we took the amount of time that was necessary. I've spoken with Julie Tesler and invited her to testify tomorrow afternoon. Uh, fortunately, we have that time in our schedule. Um, so beginning at 1.15, we'll meet with Julie Tesler from Care Partners. Uh, we will come back in the morning to uh, address the work that we worked on yesterday in committee around uh, audio only. And Representative Houghton has given me some sense that we should be able to bring that to closure in the time after the floor tomorrow morning. So that's the plan. Uh, apologies, and Julie Tesler is being incredibly flexible. I appreciate her assistance and flex flexing for us. Um, this afternoon, we have a number of witnesses. We, are, we will be back in committee, uh, let's say 15 minutes after the floor, whatever that, approximates, we do need these breaks as well. Uh, and I don't think we'll be on the floor very long, but let's, let's come back 15 minutes after the floor. And Colleen will make sure we have the right link. And uh, with that, let's, let's take a breather. We need it. Thank you all. This is, your questions are completely, we're, we're great. And uh, I, there's a lot more questions we wanna ask still. Thank you.